Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we uh, gathered here this evening, the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here tonight. My name is Adrian Pickley. I'm the director of the uh, newly uh, begun Gonski Institute, started uh, on Thursday, so we are very new. So welcome to the first uh, event under the Institute uh, uh, with the School of Education here at the University of New South Wales. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for coming along tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. And a person who comes from the country like me, I appreciate it when anyone travels in Sydney uh, any time because uh, I know the logistical difficulties of it. Uh, I had to park in uh, South Parramatta just to be here tonight. Um, I'm also the former New South Wales uh, Minister for Education, uh, former as of about a year ago and former as a Member of Parliament about six months ago. And uh, I was just saying on the way in, I'm, I'm a bit rusty when it comes to speeches. The only lectures I've been given in, giving in the last six months are uh, to my seven-year-old and to my ten-year-old. And uh, hopefully, if I ever have to give a lecture at the University of New South Wales, it'll be more effective and have more impact than on the ones I give my seven-year-old and ten-year-old. Maybe I need some professional development, uh, Chris. Uh, I want to just uh, acknowledge that uh, today we had also the first... Um, advisory board meeting of the uh, Institute uh, and we have some of the members here uh, with us tonight uh, including the new chair Ian Arev who's down the front uh, and a couple of the other board members uh, who are able to stay with us here this evening. But uh, you are here to listen to uh, one of the most well-known uh, education thinkers in the world. Very well known here in New South Wales and Australia but certainly known around the world for various things, uh, Finnish lessons amongst, amongst other things. Uh, and we are greatly privileged to have Pazi here with us tonight, but also here in New South Wales and Australia to have Pazi joining us at the University of New South Wales as a professor of education. And whilst he belongs to this institution, uh, his contribution uh, and hopefully the contribution that we'll make as part of the Gonski Institute will be uh, not for the benefit of this institution, but indeed the benefit of all of those uh, children who attend school, uh, students who attend university and uh, vocational education uh, and training. Uh, and if there's been a great advocate of that outcome, particularly around this issue of equity, uh, it's been Parsi Salberg. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Parsi Salberg. <laughs> Okay, good day. How are you going? That's about my Australian. Can you hear me all right? Can you hear me well? Okay, good. Like, uh, like Adrian, I also want to recognize the uh, traditional owners of this land where we meet and pay my respect to uh, uh, elders, the past, present, and those who are coming. And uh, it's a, at the same time, it's a great honor. It's kind of a double honor to be here. One is the... Um, talk to you, I have so many people here tonight, um, and second is to work for this wonderful university and uh, uh, School of Education and the Konski Institute for Education, that's a new one, so um, uh, thank you for coming. A Adrian said that, that you have probably heard about me, what you, what you can read about me or hear in TV and radio is only 50% true, the rest is not, but I, you can figure out which half is not true. But there are a lot of stories, of course. If you came here to hear about Finnish education, you came, came to the wrong room. It's going to be in the next one. So I'm, I'm going to speak about a couple of things to you. One is the, the, that is like a core theme of what the Konski Institute is going to do is equity. And that's something that this could pay, take place this evening anywhere in the world. Everybody's talking about the same thing. And um, my experience is that it's a, it's a fairly difficult concept because we all have different understandings what the equity means. So I, I spend a little bit of time about the history, where we come from, and why this is a topic that needs to be discussed. And the second one is, the, like the title says, what have we done? If you travel around the world and ask this question, so what are you doing to enhance equity at the level of the system? I'm going to show you some of those things. And then I leave it 
up to you to decide what should be done here. Uh, so I'm not going to advise anybody. Uh, just like Adrian, it's a, it's a pleasure to be a public intellectual rather than a politician. So you can, you can say what you, what you think. Is this all right? How is my English? Is it all right? Yeah, I can switch to Finnish as well. No? Good. There's some people say that it doesn't really matter 5.30 in the afternoon which language you use. Is, is there anybody, um, and this is my only section of Finland, my home country. I came here you know, a couple of days ago. Um, is there anybody in the room who has visited Finland? Holy smoke, half of you. How many of you like to come and see our school system? All the rest, yeah? So it's true what they say, that there are two types of people in the world. There are Finns and wannabe Finns. <laughs> But you know, Finland is a very different place, and I need you to understand this when you listen to what I have to say. These are my two youngest sons. This picture was taken a few months ago in a very northern part of the country. The temperature at that time when they were sitting on the snow was minus 24 degrees. But they're still smiling and happy. Yeah. So that's the, the one thing that you will realize very quickly, that Finns are happy, yeah, happy people. Okay, I don't know why, but that's how it goes. What I have realized here, this is not my first time here in your beautiful country, is that you are very different people here in Australia. You're also happy, but you, you're very easygoing, and um, you do something that we do not do back home. We, you talk a lot. <laughs> yeah? You know, if you go to a cocktail reception and you see somebody standing there in the far end corner with a glass of champagne and not talking to anybody, that's a fin. <laughs> because we hate small talk. That's the last thing we want to do. And uh, my question to you now is that how, how do you recognize a, um, a introvert Finn? Do you know what introvert Finn looks like? He's somebody who is looking at his socks when he's talking to you. How, how about extrovert Finn? He's somebody who is looking at your socks when he's talking to you. <laughs> So we are very, very different, different folks. If you want to, um, if you want to see what's, what's happening um, in the world in education, this is a good Twitter address to follow. I also obviously now share with you uh, everything that happens with the Konsky Institute as well. And I'm gonna post this presentation. If there's any data, any evidence, any, anything that you would like to have, just join me in Twitter or go to my website and you can have this thing uh, over there. Are you ready to go? Are you? Are you ready to sing with me a little bit? <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but we're going to do that in, in, in a moment. Okay. So let me speak very briefly for those who are not familiar with this thing. Let me ask you first, how many of you are not a student or a staff member at this university? In other words, almost everybody. Okay, very good. So it may be that you haven't heard about this before. It may be that you know. But it's, it's important to ask the question that where do we come from with this idea of equity. Where does it come from, this, uh, this whole thing? And of course we could go hundreds of years back, but I, I'm gonna take you back about 50 years. And 50 years, roughly 50 years ago, happened something that really changed the world of education and thinking about equality and equity. And this is the, the cover page of so-called Coleman, the Coleman Report, that all the edu educators should know because it's one of the landmark studies of education research ever done. So this was published in 1966, and the long story short is that the Coleman, Coleman uh, research team concluded, among other things, that schools don't really make that much difference. That what children learn or what they don't learn in school is where they come, uh, depends where they come from. They're basically home, family background, okay? And that was, of course, this was something that people didn't want to hear, but this was the conclusion of the study. And this created a huge wave of critics, criticism, probably here in Australia as well, but certainly in the United States, where there were a lot of people who just couldn't accept this. It cannot be that way, that it doesn't matter how hard we teach certain children that they will never learn uh, anyway. In Finland, back home, we had that type of attitude about 10 years before the Coleman Report. There was kind of a serious beliefs that there are certain children in the society who will never learn reading, math, or foreign languages. So there's no use even trying. So let's track them to a particular stream in schooling and give them some, some education. But 
let's focus on those who are, have ability to learn. So this, this was a kind of echoed uh, by the, the Coleman study. A little later, about 10 years later, there was another significant thing. I don't know how many of you have heard about Ron Edmonds, Ronald Edmonds. Very, very important, um, important uh, American uh, education policymaker, authority researcher as well. And based on their, his research and his colleagues' research, they concluded that what Coleman is saying is basically wrong. So he's saying that if we do the right thing, and if we really want to do the right thing, we can teach all the children in all the schools in our system as society. Okay? So this started that kind of a kicked off a, what we know, a um, effect, effective schools movement. They basically started to identify what are those um, elements of schooling that make schools work well so that everybody, all the children learn there. Okay? So this was a very important moment that triggered the whole effective school effectiveness, uh, effectiveness um, uh, wheel of, field of research. Then the next one in my line of history is the establishing the International Congress for School Effectiveness and School Improvement. This happened in 1990. And this is the cover of the journal of the, the scientific uh, academic society. What was interesting with this, also known as ICSE, what was in interesting in this, uh, this group of researchers that it brought together two schools of scholars, those who were researching the school effects, who tried to identify what makes schools work and what's happening with those schools that are not working well, and then the school improvement folks, those who tried to figure out how to make schools that are not working well uh, effective schools. And there has been a lot of research happening ever since. The ICSI is still alive and well. And uh, Australia has had a big part to play in ICSI. It's been hosted and stayed here in this country for, for many years. Um, and for the equity work, it's been a really uh, important thing. And then came the OECD PISA in year 2000. Sometimes when people introduce me in a conferences and speeches like this, they introduce me as PISA Salber. <laughs> and not to be confused with PISA. And you know what PISA did, among many things, was that it brought the equity into the, the policy agenda, seriously, at the level of the global education discourse. Because before the OECD PISA, there was not really any measures, any evidence or data globally, you know, how different education systems, like Australia or Finland or England, how do they perform if we look at the equity of the system, equity of the outcomes. And PISA was the first time when, where there was a systematic uh, set of evidence. And it went all the way to 2011, when the, the first three PISA cycles, 2000, 2003 and 2006, where the whole cycle was um, completed once, when the OECD published this report that is extremely important, influential equity and, and quality in education. And this report includes the, the data from the pr previous OECD PISA studies, and it concludes things that I'm going to show you in a little bit later. Uh, almost at the same time, there was uh, work in the US uh, Congress for each and every child, every, uh, basically the same thing. How do we make American school education system or school system more equitable? The same happened in Canada, Sweden, many other countries, and obviously also here in Australia when the Konskis uh, report was released. So this is like a brief line of events that has uh, then accumulated to the situation where we are right now, that every country, basically every country around the world is talking about how to make the system, how to improve equity in the system, not, not just the quality of outcomes, but equity. Are you with me? Okay, so this is where we, we come from. The equity is not a kind of a new thing at all. So this is a little task for you now, because I don't know what you know, what you think about equity, but you can share this with your neighbor. Okay, this is one of those nice activities that we sometimes do. So turn to your neighbor and just take one minute and think, when you look at your neighbor, whoever he or she is, consider this person as a 10-year-old. So how would you explain to a 10-year-old what equity in education means, okay? And then listen carefully what, what you hear from your friend, okay? Just one minute, very quickly, so that you can talk a little bit.
Okay, thank you very much, people. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I was right at least with one thing tonight, that you really like small talk. Yeah? <laughs> you like to talk to your, your friend and neighbor. That's, that's a great thing. That's an accomplishment. We, can, we cannot do that back home. Yeah, it's a silent. When I ask people to do this, there's nothing is happening. <laughs> they just look at me and say that you talk. Okay. Is there anybody in the room who would like to uh, say what you, what you heard or what you think, how to explain equity in, in a terms that everybody would understand? Now is your moment. Go ahead. Briefly, just briefly. Okay, so it's a right, everybody has an equal right to education. Let, let me take uh, one more over there. Yeah, you. Me? Yeah, no, you, you. Equity is about every child um, having what they need to reach their full potential. Okay, everybody has to be given what they need to be successful. One more, so over there. An actual 10 year old. Say, say it again. An actual 10 year old perspective. Where, okay. Oh, wonderful, okay, you speak. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's give a good hand to this one. It's great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Now, is there anybody in the room who has a completely different view about equity? This is very important because I always say that it doesn't make any sense to have any conversation whatsoever about equity in education unless we are absolutely clear that we are talking about the same thing. I have been in the meetings around the world where people start to talk about equity in education and actually they talk about something completely different. Okay, so that's why I just want to make sure that we all know this. Uh, and you know, if you go and see the literature or you um, search in, uh, um, in the internet, just put the equity in education, you get different types of things. Some of the formal ones, is the, this is a UNESCO that is saying that equity in education is the means to achieving equality, whatever it means. Okay? Uh, the OECD has a, has a definition that includes two aspects. That there's inclusion and then there's a fairness. Uh, probably many of you were thinking about something like this. And then there's, of course, uh, what the Konsky said, that equity is something that makes sure that the uh, learning dif differences do not... Um, entirely depend on or, or relate to the family background where the kids come from. So there are, there are different types of definitions. If you're going to have an equity conversation in your community, whether it's your school or uh, any type of club, make sure that people understand it correctly. Because often my experience has been that the people actually talk about equality. They, they t talk about the sameness. Equality is about sameness, giving everybody the same thing. And this has been the case in our school system in Finland and many, many school systems around the world for a long time. We want, to, we want to treat everybody fairly, equally, and give them the same curriculum, same amount of instruction, same amount of help and materials and so on. Whereas equity is something different. As you said, we have to give children what they need to be successful, right? Are you with me? Very, very important that we are talking about the same, uh, same things. Okay, now when... When we go see the international uh, world, what's, you know, how equity is measured or how, do, how, how people discuss e equity, another important thing is to understand that there's no just one type of measure for equity, although you can sometimes read about it. But equity index is like a, comp we call it a composite in index. It's something that is composed of several different indices, right? And what I'm going to show you now is not a kind of a complete composite index. Um, I think everybody can think about themselves. But, you know, these are some of those things. I'm going to show you a little bit data about what we know about these things. Uh, something that is now commonly used, and it's a very kind of a fashionable word, is the resiliency. Resili Looking at the resilient students in the country, meaning that how, ma how many of these children who are in our school system are kind of able to beat the odds? In other words, do much better than we would expect them to do, given where they come from or the characteristics. Then we are looking at the differences between girls and boys, right? Then we can look at the, the resource allocation, how the resources at the level of the system of education or the district, or even within the school, how they are allocated. Uh, again, are they allocated equally, or are the resources allocated based on equity in mind? 
Then the, uh, the, the variability of students' performance between and within schools. This is a very interesting way to look at equity as well. Then we can look at the equity in relation to achievement. Another interesting thing. And then there are some other things. Of course, the, the immigrant background is one of those things. Um, uh, the race and many other things that can be included in this uh, definition or measure of equity. So I'm not going to include more than those. I'm going to show you if, you, if you are interested in more data, go on and find it out. It's very easy to find out. But I'm going to show you what the international data says about these five things, how they are measured and what do we know about that, and how your country, how Australia as a whole is doing. I, I couldn't find the, the, the state um, or territory specific information about all of these things, but you, you can see how your country does compared to my country and many others uh, who are here in this room. So the first one is the, the uh, resilient, the percentage of resilient students. Now this is a little bit tricky thing because the, how the OECD, this is the OECD data because it's, it's the only one that we have. If you don't like the OECD data, you can close your eyes for the next five minutes and dream about something else. But the OECD defines resiliency. Listen, listen to this. The definition is that, that what is the percentage of those students who come from the bottom quartile of the socioeconomic um, background status of their families who are able to perform to the top quartile internationally. Not nationally, but internationally. In other words, how many kids in a country are able to learn so that they are among the 25% top students in the world. Okay? So this is a kind of an indication. And you will see that this is, this is Australia here, so you're doing a little bit, little bit better than the OECD average, but there's still, still way to go to some of those countries. But this is a kind of a tricky uh, data because the, the comparison to the international uh, top 20%. Uh, it make, makes some of these countries perform very difficult. So in this sense, you can say that Australia is doing a little bit better. There's more resilient students than in the OECD countries average. Not much, but a little bit. So then the girls versus boys, and they would, obviously, we should take a look at many other areas than just the, um, the literacy that is there, the reading literacy. But, you know, the interesting picture globally is that all the, in the, all the OECD countries, every single one, girls are much better readers than boys, according to the OECD data. And some of these countries, like mine, look at Finland. Finland is doing very badly here, that the boys are reading much worse today than they used to, and much worse than girls today. Now, why is this? And why in Australia, that is, where's Australia? Australia is here. So why in this country, why in your country, boys are so much worse readers, according to this study, 15-year-olds than girls? Tell me if you know. Huh? Because they're boys. Sports. No. This is something that the Konsky Institute for Education is going to figure out. <laughs> Are we going to fix it, by the way? Not tomorrow or not next year, but we have a, we have a solution to this thing. But, Again, you know, here the, the Australia, like Finland, we are not doing very well when it comes to gender um, equality or performance between boys and girls. We have to do something uh, to this thing, okay? Another way to look at the equity is to see how the, how the resources are allocated. This is a little bit complicated picture. I'm going to explain you what it is. So all the OECD countries that are measured in 2012, I'm using the 2012 here, so it's a few years back, uh, somewhere here. So, so this is a kind of a magic line here. So all the countries that are on this side, between, be, between this space here, they are the countries where they allocate money based on the needs of the school or the individuals. All the other countries, if you are here, the further you come here, less equity there is in terms of the funding. So Mexico, Turkey, Australia is here, New Zealand have a policy structure to fund, kind of a fund inequity, if you wish. Okay. So that's the, um, that's the image. Almost all the, all the countries are very close to here, which means that they basically give the money based on headcount. They see how many kids are in the school, and then they get this, every school gets the same, same amount. But Finland is a different. You see, we are the only ones that has a kind of a clear policy to give money to the schools and communities based on what they need. Okay? 
Then the next one, and this is the, uh, this is the fourth one, and this is another way to look at equity as well, based on the international data. Again, a little bit tricky picture, but I'm going to explain to you what it is. So we are looking at the, um, the performance variation. In this case, I think it's a science, yeah, science performance, in different countries. And this is a reference here. The OECD is, the variation is 100, okay? And you see that in the OECD countries, about 30% of the variation, total variation of students is between school variation, okay? And the rest, 70%, is within school, okay? So this is how the variation of different test results of kids can be explained. Now, this is fin Iceland and Finland here. You will see that we have a school system in Iceland and Finland where the tiny little part, about 8% in Finland and 5% in Iceland, is between school variation. What does it mean in practice? It means that for parents' point of view, statistically, it means that all the schools are performing pretty much the same, okay? So if you're a parent in Finland or Iceland or Norway or Ireland or Denmark, you don't need to really worry about the schools. Of course you do, but you don't need to, it's not like a big concern. Is it a big concern here? Yes. yes. <laughs> all right. So, Australia is here, you're very close to OECD average, but you, your total variation is 117. So it means that overall in this country you have more variation. So you have the, the gap between those who are not doing very well in science and those who are good in science is bigger than in the OECD or in Finland or many other countries. And, and the big part of that variation here is the uh, within school variation as well. Well, basically, if you look at the Finnish case here, so how do you explain this? What does it mean? So it means that the Finnish schools probably, and the Icelandic schools, Icelandic schools and Norway schools, they probably have some systems built into the schools that is trying to cope and deal with those differences that children bring to school every day. We have children who, have, who are different and have differences just like you, not probably in the same scale, and same amount, but we do have kids that are, who are very different, just like Norway and other countries. But, you know, the, if you just look at this data here, the only way to explain this difference between Aus Australia and countries here is that these, these schools here, they must do something to cope and deal better with those differences and inequalities that kids bring to school. Again, I don't know exactly what it is, but that's what this data indicates. Are you with me? Okay, good, one more, and then we sing. Are you ready for that? Yeah, okay. Now, <clears throat> this is my last image here. And so now we are looking at the, the achievement and equity. Um, basically, what we are looking at here is quality on this side. I call it student achievement on the vertical side and equity of outcomes on the horizontal side. And this little dot here is the international average of these two variables here, okay? So if your country is here, it means that you are you are very close to international average with these two variables, quality and equity, or student, uh, student achievement, student outcomes, and equity of outcomes over there, okay? So if you happen to be in this space here as a country, so if Australia or any country is here, it means that you're really in trouble. You're in trouble because you are doing worse, you have less equity, okay? So you have less equity and you have less quality than the average, okay? So nobody wants to be here. If you're a minister of education and you find yourself here, you get really bad grades, okay? Or what do you think, Adrian? Uh, yes. uh, you agree, okay? So if you're here, it means that you have issue with equity, but you have a high quality outcomes. Here are the countries where there's a lot of more equity, but problem with the quality of outcomes. So the kids' learning levels are not in this test uh, what it should be. So everybody would like to aim at being here, right? This is where everybody wants to be. Every minister in the world would say that this is what my dream is to be somewhere here. You understand? Yeah, okay. Now, where's Australia here? No. Think twice. Now, tell your neighbor there. So I'll give you half a minute. And give you a best guess. If, you, if I was your teacher and asked you to put the Australian plaque here, where would you put it and why? Just very quickly, half a minute. Okay, thank you so much. Now, if, there are, if you have any questions about what, 
you know, how this equity is measured, what, what, what does it mean? So this index that is used, this uh, economic, social, and cultural, cultural status, is a, is a common use of calculating kind of a numeric value for equity. And the OECD is basically looking at asking students, 15-year-old students, what do your parents do? What type of education do they have? And how many books do you have at home? How many books, 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 number of books is a very good indication about what's happening at home. Of course, they're asking some other things as well, but basically asking these three things from all the students when they take the test gives you a whole uh, lot of things about, you know, the equity and social economic background, okay? So that's how it's calculated here. And now, so where's Australia? Somewhere there. I agree with you. Yeah? That's where you are. Now, raise your hand if you're surprised a little bit. Take a look around. Almost everybody's surprised. I think you're surprised because you, you are, I think Australia has been blamed and shamed by media and others saying that you are, you are doing horrible things and your school system is failing and everybody's bad and teachers are not doing what they're supposed to do and so on. It's not true. You know, the data says that it's not great either. The data says that you are, you are on a good side. So you are on a positive side of this uh, these two variables, but you're getting close to get your feet frozen or wet. So that's a kind of a, I, I wouldn't say that this is an alarming situation if you ask my opinion, but I would say that we should think hard, you know, why is this and what should we do? But again, the Konsky Institute for Education, we're going to fix this, yeah? Just wait. Okay. Now, who, who are the others? This is the United States, so you are doing better than uh, the U.S., this is U.K., and this is your dear friend, New Zealand over there, okay? Now, now, if you just look at this data here, this data here, you could conclude that if you just speak one language in your country, you're average. How many of you speak more than one language? Almost everybody, okay? So the good plan for this, based on, if you don't see anything else, is to say that, okay, let's introduce a foreign language in all the schools in Australia, and kids will probably do better. Right? I, you were talking about the right to education. If I was a king of Australia, then I'm, uh, I'm actually not. But if I was, I would issue this as a law. My first law in education would be every, every child in Australia in this country has a right to learn another language, whatever it is. Right? It can be Chinese or Finnish or German or French or Spanish. It doesn't matter because learning another language is good for you. Those little boys that you saw in, my, in the sitting in the snow, they speak three languages already. And when they come with me, when we move to Australia, they will learn to speak Australian. <laughs> it's a fourth language. And they get smarter all the time. You know, more languages you learn, the, the better you are. Okay, so look at Canada. And, and this is for all those in the audience, everybody there, who say that, I really don't like Finland. I've heard enough. If you think like this, go to Canada. It's equally cold. They play almost as good ice hockey than we do, but they have a wonderful edu education system throughout the country. And I'm, you know, always when I read somebody here in Australia writing about why Finland is a bad benchmark and we should not look at Finland because you know they have this and that, I say, why don't you look at Canada? Canada is pretty much like Australia, right? They have states and the same size and same history and culture and all those things. But why? How do you explain this one? The Canada is doing so well. Any Canadians in this room? Wonderful. Good luck. Yeah. How many of you would like to be a Canadian? <laughs> you know, when I do this thing in the United States of America now, everybody wants to be Canadian. <laughs> and that's why, you know, people say that the world needs more Canada. I, I fully agree when it comes to education. So take a look at Canada too. You know, Canada is so, so good in many things, but particularly education, that I say that Canada is in heaven. <laughs> this is the educational heaven that is white cloud because that's the place where equity and quality of outcomes meet, according to the OECD evidence. And we don't have any other evidence. If you don't like OECD evidence, you can just keep on dreaming. Okay? So then we have Canada over there, then we have Estonia. Any Estonians in the room? Okay? Then we have Japan and Finland. And this is the quartet of high performance, according to the OECD, right now, at this moment, okay? So, 
let's look at the others. Then you see the other OECD countries here, and you will realize something interesting. First of all, there are a couple of outliers. This is Iceland. I can, I can tell you a secret if you, don't, if you promise not to tweet <laughs> and to tell anybody else, okay? You know why Iceland is doing that badly? The short, big, uh, long story short is that when Iceland had the economic collapse in 2008, they stopped doing something. And what they stopped doing is, because Iceland is so small that they have to test in Pisa everybody, all the students. It's so small country, 300,000 people. And the kids were saying that, why should I take this PISA test? What is it good for me? And teachers say that, no, it's not good for you. It's just, you know, the OECD is doing that. And the kids say that, I'm, I'm not going to do the test. And then the authorities, the Ministry of Education, say that, hey, kids, if you do the test, we're going to give you pizza and Coke. <laughs> and the kids were very happy to do that. All the way until 2009. 2009 test, Iceland didn't have money anymore for pizza and Coke. So the kids came to take the test, and everybody knew that time that pizza test actually is a pizza test. <laughs> because when I take the test, I get a slice of pizza and Coke. But when the government said, that, sorry, there's no pizza and no Coke, the kids said, no pizza, no test. <laughs> and there you see them going. <laughs> but don't tell anybody. I heard this from, from uh, inner circles. <laughs> okay? But, you know, one thing that you can see here is that the, um, anybody of you, anyone of you who has done your statistics, you realize that you know, if you look at these countries, that they somehow fall on the line, the regression line. In other words, there's a correlation. But now remember, this correlation is not causation. It's just a correlation between these two variables, equity and, and quality. But I'm not using the line because I want you to remember when you go home from here that this is actually a stairway to heaven. Remember this song? <laughs> Beautiful, yeah? The most of you were not born when this song was written in 1971. Led Zeppelin. Raise your hand if you like Led Zeppelin. Like all the senior people like myself. <laughs> but you, we still remember? That is Led Zeppelin. Okay. Now, for those who are, come from Hong Kong or Singapore or China, just take a, take a look at this. The interesting thing is that Singapore and China seem to have a huge issue with equity. Very high student test scores in reading math and science. But the issue with equity. I, I came from Singapore two days ago, and I, I do a lot of work there and, and spend time with my colleagues and, and politicians as well. And everybody admits that this is the case. It's a good system, but the equity is the... Uh, is the issue. The same is now through in China, when China is having more, more uh, regions and places to, 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 to be testing, included in PISA than just uh, Shanghai. Shanghai is part of this thing. But Hong Kong is here. Is there anybody from Hong Kong here in the room? Raise your hand if you're from Hong Kong. One person, okay? But many of you, Chris, has, you've been working in Hong Kong, right? But this is, it's an interesting question. What, what is, why is Hong Kong there? Is this a measuring mistake, or are they doing something different. It's a very in, in, important question over there. So what is this country over there? North Korea. Uh, sorry, South Korea. <laughs> is there anybody from South Korea here in this room? Okay. You know, I go to Seoul every now and then and work there with my friends. And, and for a long time, South Korea was there in heaven. And now they are not in heaven anymore. But they're, South Korea is so close to heaven that it's a uh, like knocking on heaven's door. <laughs> Remember this song? Now, you have a chance to sing with me. Would you like to do that? Hey, Sydney, come on. Do you want to sing with me? Yeah, okay, let's see. It's a very short one, so you have four chances to sing with me, okay? Come on. Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Louder, much louder, people. You can do that. Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Raise your hand with me and sing loudly. <laughs> knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Raise both of your hands one last time. <laughs> knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Wow, I love you, people. I love you. <laughs> Thank you. You know what music does? Music makes you feel free. That's why in Finland, 
and Iceland and many other countries, we do a lot of music for kids. We think that music is at least as important as reading and math and science because it helps you learn things. That's why I sing with you, because I want you to remember. Knocking on heaven's door and stay away to heaven. Do you know what's the option then if you don't do that? It's a, it's a good old Australian song called <laughs> Highway to Hell. <laughs> so be careful. Now, very quickly now, I conclude here. And I get serious for a moment now. So I, I leave you with five things. And this is not just from my head. This is from my experience from my own country and others like Canada and Estonia, the Netherlands, the, all the Nordic countries. You know, if you ask the question that what have we learned if, you, if we go and study more carefully, what equity, what, what, what does it look like? These are the things that you, you will find. The first one, oh, sorry. Take a look at this. This is the OECD thing. You can just read this last one here. This is not my thing. This is the, what the OECD says, that the highest performing education systems are those that combine these two things. So this is very important, uh, important right now. But these are also actually remarkable OECD conclusions, where the OECD is, is saying that school choice is not a good idea. They are segregating kids. And when you segregate children in different schools, it uh, drives you to inequity. Okay? But let me speak about these five things very quickly. The first one is, and I call it the positive discrimination policy. I don't know if you like the word, but this is the word that we use and some others, in particularly in funding, school funding. And positive discrimination means, in practice, for example, in my hometown, it means that the schools that have more immigrant background children or more children with special needs or otherwise more difficult conditions than others, they will get more resources. And there's a kind of a formula that the city, this local government is using when they calculate how much more money this, this school gets. And you know what happens? All of a sudden these schools, at least in my town and many other uh, cities in, in, in Finland, are the places where all the teachers want to work. So when they are post-opening in one of these hardship schools, where almost every child has, were born somewhere outside of the country, they don't speak Finnish. When they have a post opening for classroom teacher in a primary school, there are tens of applicants there. Everybody wants to teach in those schools because they know that the class sizes are smaller, they have resources, they have additional staff and members uh, helping them in a the classroom, and they really want to make a difference in these children's lives. The, can, some of the Canadian provinces are doing the same thing. So this uh, positive discrimination policy is a very important kind of a concrete way to enhance, uh, improve equity. Then the other, the next one is to focus on health, well-being, and happiness. And this is not just, you know, to say something, but, you know, add and include this as a formal part of your education policy and, uh, and curriculum. If you go to Canada, if you go to Ontario, for example, you will find that Ontario has four priorities at the level of the province. Ontario is like New South Wales. One of those four is well-being and health of children and teachers. So government is taking it very, very seriously, investing money into this, making sure that all the kids are healthy, feel good, and they're happy, and teachers too. Okay? So it's a very, very important thing to do. In Finland, for example, my country, we have healthy school meal free of charge for everybody, all, all the children and teachers every day. There, there's a medical service and dental service and counseling and all those things available for every child every day in every school. Do you? Maybe. Okay. Anyway, that's the, that's the important thing. And then the inclusive education uh, support for everybody. And there are two things in this. I'm talking about the special education here. I think it's not enough to just have a, some kind of special education in the system. You need to have something that is uh, truly inclusive and something that is uh, based on early intervention. A system that is allowing schools and teachers to intervene early. This is what the, all the Nordic countries do this. That we don't need to, our teachers, don't, they don't need to wait when they see that there's a problem or trouble in a the classroom. They can start action, acting and helping kids right now. Of course, if, they need to, if, the, if the need is so big that the child has to be taken to a special group or clinic or something else, then it requires more time. That, but this kind of first aid and special needs can start immediately, okay? Then a couple of more. Then the early childhood education is an absolutely critical part in all of these more equitable systems that you saw there. There's no equity without focus on early childhood 
education and care. In my country, for example, kids go to school when they're seven years old. They go to school when they're seven, okay? They can play in the snow and sing and dance all the way until then, yeah? And before that, there's no school. There's no school like uh, the types of things. But the early childhood care is there and is trying to help everybody to grow up happy and healthy. Here in, in Australia, I often hear people saying things about school readiness. Have you heard about school readiness? What does it mean for you? That the child is ready to start school, right? You know, the Finnish definition for, or Swedish, or Icelandic definition for school readiness is that the school must be ready for the child. It's quite different, isn't it? Yeah. So we, we are much more worried that every school should be ready to welcome all the children as they are. If you're a parent in my country, or Iceland, you don't need to really worry about whether my, my sons, whether they're ready for school. I, I can rely on the schools that they will take, you know, they, they figure out what to do. Okay? It's very, very important for equity sake as well. And then finally, the, the whole child approach. And this is, the, this is kind of a bedrock of the equity work meaning that we understand that children are different and we need to organize curriculum and pedagogy and leadership, all those things in the school so that we understand that the kids are different. They have different intelligences and talents and interests. And there's no thing that would be more important than something else. As I said, in my school system or any school system in Nordic countries, uh, think that music and arts and drama and physical education are equally important than science, reading and math. Because they are, okay? And that's, that's about equity, okay? So this is a bonus for you. And I, I did this particularly for Australia, for New South Wales. And, and take a look at this. Now one thing, and I, I kind of constructed this data for you just to, just to make my point very clearly here. So there, there are two variables here. One is the, the, how women are empowered in politics in New South Wales. And there are people who know that much more of, about this that I do, or Australia. So this is, we look at the percentage of women in the national parliaments, okay? So we start from 20% all the way to, there's no country that has, in the OECD has more than 45% of women, okay? And then we have the, the so-called mother index. Have you heard about mother index? This is something that the uh, Save the Children does every year. So they rank countries based on how good or poor country is to be a mother. So it looks, it looks at the healthcare and early childhood education and women's employment and the education and parental leave and prenatal care and you know, all those things that the mothers care, okay? And then the countries are rank ordered from the, from the best, number one, to the worst. There are about 30 countries in this list now, okay? So where's Australia? You wanna close your eyes? You're quite good actually. Okay, are you surprised? Raise your hand if you're a little bit surprised. Yeah? You know, this Australia is not the bad place at all. But that's why I'm coming here with my two little boys. Okay, um, this is the United States of America. We lived three years in, in the United States of America in Boston, but we are fine now. And you know, one, one of the reasons that made move leaving that country easy was that the fact that you have two little children there it's not going to be easy there. America is not really easy for a foreigner immigrant like we were to have small children to pay about daycare. You know, the daycare was $30,000 a year. Three, zero, thousand. We went back home and it was free of charge. <laughs> when I went to look for daycare to a three-year-old in Cambridge, Massachusetts, there's a great place to stay otherwise. The first thing they asked me that how many letters and numbers do your son know? Three-year-old. I said, do you want to see his CV? <laughs> I said, why do you ask about letters and numbers? And they were very serious. They said, we are very concerned here that all our children will be ready to school, go to school. I said, he doesn't know any letters or numbers. But he's a very good painter. And he likes African music. He can dance. <laughs> but that was not good enough for that daycare. So. And it was $35,000 a year, so it was easy to leave, okay? So this is the um, New Zealand, and this is where Finland is. <laughs> Look at this, number one country to be a mother. So if you haven't done so yet, if you don't have children and you want to have some, 
that's what we can do. One thing we can do well is to take care of families and little children. But, you know, Finland is not the only one. You know, there's a, the, all of those Scandinavian countries, there's a Norway, Iceland, Sweden, Denmark, we're all there. The Netherlands is there and Spain. So there's some, something that we do. So what's my point here? You know, my, my point here is that if we are serious about improving equity and education, we have to improve our mothers and women. And to do that, probably the best thing to do that is to give your vote to a woman. Right? If you haven't done so so far, next time you go and vote to vote, consider that because it would make Australia also better. I think. Do you agree with me? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Now this is the end. I return back to the, the uh, Ron Edmonds uh, statement. Just if, if you read this, this was written in 1979 by African-American educator. And for me, this is a reminder that what we can do with the Konsky Institute or what we can do here in Australia, New South Wales, is possible if we want to do that. And my, my personal goal here, joining this wonderful university and these colleagues here, is, is a very simple. I want to fix the equity issue here. Right? Can I do it alone? Of course not. But I know the colleagues and people and the power that the communities have here to do that together. So together we can do that. It's something that we, we can figure it out and we can solve it if we want to. If we don't want to do it, if we don't want to try, it's not, never going to happen. So with this, I... Um, Thank you very much for your attention. And there's time for questions now if you want to, or comments, or conversations. Thank you very much, people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Pazi. You never, you never uh, disappoint, that's for sure. Um, when you said uh, $30,000 in the US to send your children to an uh, early childhood Centre, um, look, just relax that if you move to the eastern suburb, it won't, suburbs, it won't cost you a cent more than about $27,000. So you can, <laughs> you can relax. And uh, the, photo of, <laughs> the photo of the two boys in the snow uh, reminded me of um, when, you, when Parsi was here last year I, with his family uh, for a few weeks. Um, I took him for lunch, took Parsi and his wife and his kids to, for lunch at Hunters Hill Pub overlooking the harbour on a beautiful spring afternoon here in Sydney and then uh, when obviously uh, there was the opportunity to work in New South Wales um, uh, and, and live here in Sydney, um, Parsi took the opportunity because uh, it's a lot warmer than, uh, than that picture that we saw up there. I would be happy to take uh, a few questions. Um, anybody want to start? Oh, let's go right up the back. Yep. Oh, young, young gentleman up the back. You know, I, I really hate to talk about Finnish education, but since the question was, uh, the paid question was there, I, I will uh, say something. You know, first thing is that Finland really uh, doesn't care about PISA at all. We couldn't care less about that. E even if you're Minister of Education in Finland or anybody, that's not really in our radar or agenda. Even when the, when the results were good, or now when they have been declining, we are not really paying attention to those. We are not doing anything 
at the level of the education policy or improvement or development to improve PISA results. We, because we think it's the wrong way. The schools can, cannot be judged by this one metric only. Okay? And that's, that's a very, very important thing. But, of course, you know, the, the PISA thing indicates, like in many countries, like here in Australia as well, that the PISA is a, is a good indicator to confirm our national findings. And we have found this thing already before the PISA results came out. That we, we, we knew that the, the, particularly the Finnish boys were not learning as they used to. Okay? The Finnish girls are still doing great, as you saw in the reading thing. Uh, so that's, is, this is not a girl problem at all. But the Finnish challenge is how do we get boys interested in engaged in schooling? And, and so, so we, are not, we are not doing things to improve PISA results. We are doing things in our policy and investing money in trying to get boys back on track. So now if you wonder what, what might be going on there, this is, this is something that even the research community back home is not really in agreement yet. My view is that something has changed radically in teenagers' lives in Finland, and probably here as well. They spend time on very different things that they used to 10 years ago, before the, uh, the smartphone uh, and, and technology really came into their lives. Now, I, I don't know what it is here, but we estimate that an, a typical teenager in Finland spends about 8 to 10 hours every day with some type of screen, smartphone, or computer, or iPad, or something like this. And this time is away from reading, this time is away from thinking about things, and this time is also making them, um, uh, making the concentration on things like learning mathematics or science more difficult. That's my theory. I'm, I'm not accusing technology, I'm just saying that the behavior has changed, and that's why what we try to do is not to fix the PISA problem, we try to help the boys get back to the track. I often say that when the PISA came in year 2000, the first thing, the, the Finland, we only had one expectation then, when we were waiting for the first PISA results, and that expectation was that we wanted to be better than Sweden. <laughs> but other than that, we had no, no uh, any, any type of uh, illusions what we want to be. But that's how it should be. And when I'm advising different governments, I always warn not to give the OECD PISA kind of a too big role in the policy. It is important. It's an indication and benchmark that shows something. But you should never change your education policies or launch education reforms only because of the PISA. There's so many other things that are important for kids. It's very cold here, yeah, but... Yeah, absolutely, absolutely good point. I, I probably would like to also ask Adrian, because Adrian has a much better understanding than I do about politics working, working for the government uh, in, in, in these issues. But you, you're absolutely right that the inequality is increasing in, also in Finland and many other countries. And my theory, uh, theory of explaining some of these things that we have seen in the world, that the equity uh, throughout the OECD countries has been declining in Finland, in Australia, in New Zealand, uh, in South Korea, many other countries. Uh, that there may be something because of the, you know, the way the young people live, what they do, but there's certainly something to do with the overall, um, you, you know, how the economic wealth is distributed in our countries. That in, in, in terms of inequality, we are getting worse, and in other words, I'm explaining you know, part of that decline that we have seen throughout the OECD countries uh, by uh, 
uh, you know, looking at the inequality. But is there anything, Adrian, that you, you, want, you can say about uh, this matter? The, the, the only thing I'd want to add to that is uh, um, where in, in, in jurisdictions where you don't have choice or certainly less choice, it's in everybody's interests that, for example, public schools in Finland are good, whether you're, whether you're the prime minister, whether you're a judge, a, a lawyer or, or anybody else. Everybody's interests that all public schools are, are, are fantastic because you're going to send your kids there. And I've seen as a former politician that um, where, where people in positions of power, and I don't mean decision pol uh, politicians necessarily, um, you know, that's where the influence is and that's where decisions get made. So um, I think in some of the segregation that we see in Australia, um, you could draw a heat map of power and you'll see in some sense the distribution of wealth to particularly schools pretty consistent with that heat map of where powerful people live. You know, you start touching certain sectors of uh, certain schools, etc., and you watch the blowback uh, from people who are in influential positions. And that's about as diplomatic as I could be <laughs> without potentially getting myself into massive amounts of trouble. <laughs> Oh, sorry, the gentleman in the, in the orange. Well, you know, there are many types of evidence. Some of the evidence comes from the projects that have been investigated throughout the world, including here in Australia. But the interesting evidence, again, comes from the OECD itself. A couple of years ago, the OECD used the, this um, huge big data bank that they have about 15 years around the world. And their conclusion is a long analysis, but their conclusion was that when technology, they basically say that technology is not helping kids to learn. Actually, in many cases, when the more children spend time with the technology, whether in school or outside of the school, the worse the math, the math performance is. But I also know that there are, there are cases where, where these types of experiments have been done in a different way, uh, where the results are different. But I, I think that the, the fact is that, because I, you know, I'm mostly interested in the whole system, like a, the, um, the New South Wales or Finland, or the kind of a big system. Um, so my view is that it's a very difficult to make all the teachers understand what to do with the technology. You know, if, in my country, we have a lot of teachers who say that we, I do not believe that technology should be used in my classroom. And when I say that, tell me more about why you think that, they say that, because you know, these kids in my classroom, these are all 15 year old boys and girls. All of them, they spend eight to 10 to 12 hours every day with this technology. Why should I do more of the same thing? Because I think that these kids need me. They need a human person to talk to, to have a conversation, to gain empathy. Look me into my eyes and try to understand how I feel about these things. And when I hear teachers saying back home something like this, I said, keep on going. You do what you think is the best thing to do with the kids. But I also know I have a lot of friends and colleagues back home who do wonderful things with the technology. And they really help, particularly in a special education, that they can help kids to come out with the difficulties and problems that they have. So for me, the technology is not the kind of a one-size-fit-all solution. It's, not, it's never going to solve the problems in education. So that's why, you know, my call is always to, to listen to the teacher's wisdom and ask them and listen carefully what they, what they think is the best thing to do with their kids rather than issue a regulation and say that now everybody has to spend this amount of time with the technology. I've seen those countries and those school systems in the world where teachers have to do something that they don't like to do, and that's the wrong way to go. Technology is great, but we have to be very mindful and careful with that. And we know that our students are not all born with academic English. Um, and our students have varied access to academic English. So I'm just wondering, assuming that all education happens through the medium of language, why linguistic equity is not one of the, the five points there? It, it absolutely is. And if you read, if you go and, and take you know, all the data that is there, the, of course the language that is your home language is one of the big things that we should look at. But I just didn't include it. I, maybe I should have done that. 
but that's the, uh, that's the thing. In Australia, as a country as a whole, there's not a kind of a huge difference between the, the home language and the, the kind of a native English speakers here, but there is in favor of those who speak English at home, but not big. But you know, I have also the one thing that Adrian knows very well, is that Australia is one of those three countries within the OECD where the, the immigrant background, first generation immigrants, improve your national PISA scores in reading, math, and science, okay? The other one is New Zealand, and the third one is Canada, okay? All the other countries, mine and US and England, we have a huge gap between those who were not born in Finland and those who were born and speak Finnish. Uh, but you, so you are special. But I leave it to you to figure out why. <laughs> you probably know that. <laughs> uh, the lady in the, the lady in the middle. Yep. Thanks for many countries in the world and you're always sharing your experiences and knowledge of those countries and their education system. But what good reasons have you come to about why Canada, Finland, Singapore, Japan and so on rate highly from the standpoint of the of the um, yeah, the, the Okay, I can answer this question in three words. Read my book. <laughs> it's, a, it's a long story, but basically it's a, it's a great question. But you know, one, one way to, to answer this question is that all of these countries that you mentioned have one way, in one way or the other, stayed away from what, what I call in my book and others are calling it as well. It's a very common term in New Zealand now. Global Educational Reform Movement, GERM. So we have been very good in resisting this, uh, this idea, um, and, and that's one thing. And the, you know, you know, the fundamental elements of this antidote to germ is the teacher and leader professionalism. It's a not standardization, but you know, making curriculum and schools more flexible, trusting schools, um, and building responsibility rather than testing schools and insisting accountability and many other things. So those are some of those things that we have analyzed. It's not only me, but this has been analyzed by many, many people. Michael Fullan has done a great work here in, in Australia and around the world. And th those are, there are some kind of a set of things that distinguish those countries that have been able to have more equitable school system and those who have not. But it's not, it's not a simple thing to do, but that's, that's one, way to, one way to look at this. Thanks for your question. Yeah, great question. If it helps you, they're doing exactly the same. Paperwork and bureaucracy all around the world. You know, if this, if you, if we, you uh, are your teacher or principal? Teacher. Your teacher. Okay, if you were to spend time with your Canadian colleagues or, or Finnish colleagues or, or British uh, colleagues, everybody says the same thing. Paperwork and paperwork and bureaucracy and meetings and sometimes they say that we have meetings about meetings. And then in America, they said, we have meetings about meetings about meetings. Uh, and and I, I've, I'm fully, this, with, with this one, I'm fully with you. And I understand that the, the, at the same time, schools and teachers are asked to figure out new problems and issues, like this, the use of technology. I was with the ABC radio today, and they asked me that, you know, how to, what, what, what do people do in other countries to control, make kind of a sensible use of, of technology? And I said, what I see in many countries is that teachers are turning into police officers in trying to control and, and find out you know, who are misusing the, uh, the rule of you know, taking dirty pictures with their iPhones. And that's not teacher's job. In America, they are now considering giving teachers guns, okay? protecting kids and themselves when somebody comes and starts shooting. This is not teacher's work. Teacher's job is to teach, not to fill in papers or spend time in, a, in a meetings. So that's a, but it's a global thing. It's happening everywhere, including Finland. And I'm, I'm sad to say this, but this is, uh, this is what it is. But the Konski Institute for Education is going to fix this one as well. <laughs>
if we have a power to do that. <laughs> Well, well, in fact, the, the CEO of the New South Wales Education Standards Authority, David Di Cavallo, is here with us this evening. He's going to fix that problem for us. So we can palm that one off, Parsi, to, to David. Uh, the lady up the front, then we'll take a couple more and, um, yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And, you know, that's why I'm actually here. And that's why we have the Konsky Institute for Education. Do you want to say something about what, we, what the, the, the Institute is doing in the rural and remote parts of the country? Just a, just a word? Just, just, just very briefly, but one of the projects that we certainly want to undertake is around rural, rural and remote uh, education and, of course, uh, Aboriginal education and what we can learn from uh, Aboriginal culture in terms of its contribution to to education in Australia, um, where we've seen the greatest success in Aboriginal education is actually uh, educating people around uh, Aboriginal culture, uh, whether they be teachers, staff, parents, uh, and the community themselves. So, um, you know, I'd be interested in having a further conversation with you about it because it's obviously one of those critical areas. And coming from Western New South Wales myself, I have a personal um, and significant interest in it. Yeah. Thank you. One more, one more. I'm looking at Adrian, Adrian again. But let me say very, very briefly how I see this uh, thing. And, and by saying this, I also want to just repeat once again how honoured and, and pleased I am to have this opportunity to work here. I'm really taking this seriously. And partly because this, the question that you raised is new to me. This is something that I know very little, but I want to learn more. I want to understand more about what you're saying and, and what we can learn from the different practices and cultures and traditions, not only here, but throughout the world. So that's the kind of, a, kind of an incentive for me. But I think, you know, my way of thinking about fixing this problem is very simple. I think about, th we need to do three things. We need to have a dream. And my dream is to remove equity and inequality from the school system here. You call me crazy, that's fine. But that's my dream. The second is that we need to understand the problem, what the problem is. And at least I do not know, I cannot explain in a clear terms what the, problem, what the problem is. Because in education the problem is not always what it seems to be. For example, the problem is not that the boys are not learning. Or the problem is not that somebody is not engaged or somebody is dropping out. That's not the problem. That's a symptom of something much deeper. And that's where we need research, right? We need to research so that we really understand what the problem is. And there are, you know, people say that Einstein used to say, it is not true, but it's a nice, uh, nice uh, adage. Einstein used to say that if I had to solve a very, very hard problem in an hour, I would take 55 minutes to understand what the problem is and then work it out in five minutes. And what we're going to do is, is the same thing. We really need to be clear what the problem is. And then thirdly, what we need is, is a theory of change how to get from here to the dream. Okay? It may take some time, but there's no shortcut into this thing. And this, so, so if there's any con contribution that I can make personally with my colleagues here in this university and beyond, it's this, to try to understand where we are, what, what are we facing right now, and where we want to go, and then think about the theory of action and change. Is there anything you want to add, Adrian? 
Yeah, yeah it's good. Okay. Now, was this any uh, interesting for you? Yeah. Do you want to come again? Yeah. Okay. We are going to be teach. I'm going to be teaching hopefully here uh, later this year, next year. So, if you're a student here, come and take my course, and we can continue go deeper in these conversations over there. Okay. <laughs> okay. And we're going to do a lot of uh, professional development and other things here with Adrian and other people, other colleagues here. So keep an eye on those things. And if you want to take a closer look at this data, I try to post this on my website and my Twitter thing later today so that you can have, you can, you can do whatever you want to do. Thank you once again for coming and take care. Thank you.